Okay, welcome to a, another edition of Chess Openings Explained. Um, this week is the first week that we're going to take a viewer submission. Um, so this is this goes out to uh, Mike Spence, who wanted to see the Banco Gambit as as uh, from the white side. So we're going to go over uh, the Banco today. We're going to check it out, try to understand the different plans and strategies around it, and we're going to focus on the Fianchetto variation for white which is one of the most solid ways to play. Um, so we'll get this on the board. Um, so after d4, white is hoping to play e4 and get a big center. So one of the ways blacks can counter it is with knight f6. So you're right, so he's, he's fighting for control here of the center. And white plays the most common move here, which is c4. It's, it's not the only move, but uh, white is just gaining a little bit of space. He's going to play knight c3 and try to play e4 again. So there's a lot of different ways black can address this. How should he uh, attack the center? Should he give white the center? Um, when you play um, for the Banco Gambit or for the, the Benoni, it starts with the move c5. So if you're playing this with the black side, uh, you need to know what happens if white doesn't advance, which is the, the most popular move. If they play a move like knight f3, um, black players should be ready because now you're, you're entering in to an English after uh, some trades here. So black would need to know that. If you're comfortable playing this way with white, this is a, a good alternative. Um, maybe your opponent as black isn't quite ready for, he's, you know, he only studied d5. He's not ready for the knight f3 lines going back into an English. But uh, the most popular move and the one we're going to look at today is d5. So white grabs a lot of center. Um, and so there's, there's some obvious pros and some, uh, some cons. Whenever you move your pawns in the center, you, you get stuff. You get a lot of space. Um, mostly, black is unable to put his knight on c6, which is a, a nice achievement. But when you move your pawns, you are weakening the, the dark square diagonal. So from the a1 to h8, um, this diagonal is a little bit weaker because you no longer have a pawn on d4. So black will very often fianchetto his bishop. Um, that is, so he's going to, this black's plan is to put his bishop over here. And that's a very nice diagonal. <clears throat> now, one thing that they sometimes do, um, with, with, if you're not going to play the Benoni, if you're going to, sorry, if you're not going to play the Banco, if you're going to play the Benoni, uh, you can expect the move e6. So as white, you should know something uh, about this opening. Um, I'll show it only very briefly. Um, so after, you'll get this structure. And there's a lot of different plans for white. He can do a lot of different setups here. Um, he can even do a Fianchetto system, kind of like what we're going to show in the game. Uh, but this, this is a, a much different opening. And the most aggressive plan white can try is just e4 and f4. And he's, you know, he's just trying to crash through in the center and just blow black off the board. Um, so that would be the Benoni. There's also another way for black to play in this position. And that is to sacrifice a pawn. So the move b5, he's, you know, he's offering you a pawn. Um, and you don't have to take. But that's, uh, we're going to look at, at the most critical lines today, so we're going to accept the gambit. Um, we're going to take on b5. Now, part of black's point is he's going to play a6. And if you accept, which is what we're going to check out today, uh, you're opening, you know, he has the a and the b files for his compensation. Um, so he's going to try to get a lot of pressure on the queen side and show that it's enough, that it's worth a pawn. Um, this is one of the most respected gambits, so if you, if you do want to play a gambit, um, this is a very good one to consider as black. It's, uh, it's not seen at the very highest level so much, but it's, it's popular enough that uh, you know, you're going to see it at, at the grandmaster level. Um, okay, you don't have to. Um, uh, the most popular way to decline is just to play b6, and, in, and this is a great way to play as white too. Um, you're just not opening the A file. You're giving back the pawn. At some point, black will, will take. And then you know, you'll, you'll still be slightly better. And you're just, you know, but you're not up a pawn. Um, also, a, a very aggressive player might want to check out the lines with, uh, with F3, because uh, you're just trying to play E4 as fast as possible. And these lines are, are great if you're a, a super tactical player and you want to get into some, some crazy lines. But today, uh, we're going to see the, the critical test of any gambit is what happens if you accept it. We just we take the pawn. Um, so in this position, uh, it looks like he's about ready to take the pawn back. And you can. You can take it right away. It's considered a little bit more accurate, though, to start the plan with uh, g6. You're going to fianchetto your bishop. And you're going to be ready to castle. 
Now this doesn't, it applies to a lot of lines. White, uh, black is trying to take away a lot of lines that don't really affect uh, the Fianchetto player too much. But one difference is um, very often this rook is going to end up on b1. And we're going to explain why that is coming up shortly. And so if white is allowed, not that these are the best moves. I'm just putting these on the, on the board for now. Um, sometimes black will be able to play here attacking the rook. So he's waiting. He's not putting his, his bishop on a6. He hasn't committed to that plan. He might go to f5 and attack the rook. And uh, he's always trying to provoke the move e4. This is, is a, a good success for the, the second player here. Um, we're going to, obviously, the pawn's hanging here. But uh, in general, if you, if you provoke e4, uh, you're going to see, we're going to show in the first game that we look at today, what happens if white gives up the very important d3 square. So that's what, that's what we're going to be checking out. Um, so we'll get back to, to our uh, theoretical interest here. So g6, um, usually you'll play knight c3, very flexible. And now you're ready to play the move uh, e4. So um, black often now does take. Um, you, can, you don't have to, but he can take right away, especially if he's expecting sort of the classical line, which begins with the move e4. So you were prepared. You played e4. That's why you put your knight on c3. You, uh, you do realize he's going to take here, which is the main line. And you take back. So you didn't castle. But it's, it's OK. You're just going to put your king somewhere, probably on g2. You can also play h3 and get your king over to h2. Um, but this is considered sort of the, the main line. It's also a very good way to play for white. But we're going to check out um, what is, at least you know, at, at the top level, uh, the main line. So it's not, and again, it's not played at like the super GM level very often. But, uh, but when they do, it's, it's usually you'll see this, this Fianchetto variation. So you can play immediately. Uh, you, can, you can play g3. Sometimes you want to start with knight f3, um, just because then they, they still don't know what you're up to. You're hiding your intentions. Your next move still might be e4. They have to be ready for that. Um, but you're, so you're just haven't, you haven't told them yet what you're doing. You can play g3. Occasionally, you'll see games where people maneuver their knight to f4. But you really don't have to do this to, to get an advantage with white. Um, you can just play a normal move. Just get your knight to the, the best square. Um, go to the normal square. <clears throat> and OK. So black, his plans for developing, he's going to develop his bishop. He's going to get his pawn out. And he's going to have this knight that's going to be able to come over here and put a lot of pressure on d5. So that's going to be one of the main sources uh, for black to get counterplay. <clears throat> um, so white, when we're playing the Fianchetto variation, we're going to play the move g3. And we're going to put our bishop on g2. And we're not allowing this trade of light squared bishops. So we're keeping more pieces on the board. <clears throat> All right. Often they'll, they'll play here. It is important. Um, he could also castle. But it's important for black to be able to have this option as quickly as possible. Um, he often wants to be able to put pressure on the d-pawn just so that it limits white's options in the opening. So after some normal moves, um, castling is an OK move. And it's played almost as much as knight b to d7. Um, so you're just getting ready. You're going to play knight to b6. If you castle, which is, I mean, of course, is fine. Sometimes you're going to let white uh, get this, this favorable setup where after he castles, he's going to get the queen on c2 and the rook on d1. Now, that's not like it's uh, you know, a tragedy that black has allowed this setup. But it's really nice to have the rook off of the same diagonal as the bishop on a6. That way, you know, there's no you know, threats on your e-pawn. It can go to e4 at some point when it's safe to do so. <clears throat> and OK. So that's one possible move order. <clears throat> um, but considered best is knight b to d7, because now the move's castling, which seems like the most normal move, is actually inaccurate here for white. And we're going to look at a game in which this, this happens. And black's going to immediately get a lot of pressure on the d5 pawn. So the first game we're going to look at is, is we're going to see how white can get into some trouble, actually, if he, if he doesn't know what he's doing. <clears throat> so considered the most accurate move here is rook b1, which is kind of a, a strange move if you've never seen it before. But the purpose is you're trying to get this rook off the same diagonal as the bishop. So in a lot of lines, you're going to need to uh, be able to move your, your knight or have your move. Uh, yeah, so you're going to want to be able to play like b3. 
The reason is, if you castle, we'll show what can possibly go wrong. <clears throat> um, so you would like to play the move b3 here, because black is threatening to go here, forking two of your, your pawns. So you know, if you just if you pass, uh, they're going here, and they're forking some of your pawns. So <clears throat> it's hard to deal with some of these, these threats. <clears throat> OK, so you want to be able to play the move b3. But when you do this, you don't want the rook on the same diagonal as the bishop, because there's going to be some, some tricks. <clears throat> um, OK, <clears throat> so the main move is, is actually rook b1. And now White's plan for the queen side, his ideal structure, is he's going to put a pawn on b3, which controls the c4 square. And he's going to put a pawn on a4, which controls another very important light square, the b5 square. <clears throat> and then he's going to try to get this bishop ideally on the long diagonal where it can test black's bishop. The bishop on g7 is one of black's best pieces. So white really wants to put his bishop on the same diagonal. So eventually they get traded and it, it neutralizes that bishop. So OK, and here people would they castle. And we're going to see this is sort of the starting position um, of the main line here with, with rook b1. And we're going to see a couple of different plans that, that black has at his disposal. Mostly white is not playing you know, something in the center on the king's side immediately. He's not going to go try to checkmate black. He is up a pawn, and he's going to try to keep it that way. Black will get a lot of pressure on the queen side. Like one common way to do this is queen a5 and rook b7. And you have a lot of pressure on the a and b file. Also, he might you know, load up pressure on the d5 pawn and try to attack the center. So white really needs to focus on neutralizing black's threats before he does anything of his own. So we'll see um, a game where white doesn't really uh, play as best as he could. And he, he doesn't know all of the nuances and gets into trouble in the opening. Now, normally, uh, I would probably take this position and I'd show, OK, here's like the three main moves in the starting position. But I thought for this lecture in particular, it would be kind of better to show all right, this is what white can do and go wrong. And it, you know, what, what should white avoid? And then it will show a game of what should black avoid? What kind of things can, can really wreck his game immediately? <clears throat> um, and so that's what we're going to do. So two games of people playing badly. And then we'll show a game with people uh, playing the main line and going over the, uh, the main moves. So <clears throat> OK, so without further ado, we're going to go over uh, a game to show you what white should avoid doing. In this game, white does not play very well. So he's going to you know, give away control of the d3 square. And we're going to see that's the whole emphasis of the game. He loses control of some light squares on the, the queen side. And his position falls apart quickly. So here's what is to be avoided as, as white. OK, so we get to our, our position. Um, OK, and so in this game, White has castled early. He didn't play rook to b1, which is the most accurate move. And so we'll see the trouble that he can get into. So black is going to put a lot of pressure on the d5 pawn immediately when white castles. Now white will never be able to do this sort of plan because the d pawn will be hanging. <clears throat> so he needs to still try to play for, for like rook b1 here and b3 because uh, there's, there's about to be, be a lot of pressure. One problem, too, is if you play here, now this fork is, is really strong, because you're going to win one of your pawns back. So, and then black will actually be slightly better. But in our game, rook e1 was played, and white's about to play e4. So after he plays e4, he really gives away the d3 square. And this is kind of one of the most important things you need to know if you're playing the white side. You've got to be really, really careful when you push your e pawn. Because it, it might not look like it now. There's only a bishop that can go to d3. But black is going to try to maneuver his knights to the d3 square. And if a knight or a bishop lands on d3, you can be in a lot of trouble. Also, the other knight uh, is it's able. He can get there, too. He can take a slightly different route. But you'll have two knights that can potentially go to d3, which is also important. Because if you put a knight here, and we trade one of the knights, and you have to take back with the bishop. It's not going to be as good. So you want both of your knights to be able to go to d5, so that even if we trade one, you'll have one of them that's able to go to d3. <clears throat> OK, and that's what black does immediately. So he's heading towards the d3 square. 
Um, if we passed, it wouldn't, wouldn't really make sense to do it immediately because then we would just be able to trade and you'd have to you know, take back with a bishop. And you don't want your bishop on d5, you want your knight there. So he's not threatening to do it immediately. <clears throat> but white here kind of has a problem. Black is getting ready to play knight to c4, but you can't stop him from, from, uh, from going there <clears throat> because this guy would be hanging. Um, it's important to notice the bishop on that long diagonal. You never want to forget he's there because he's one of black's best pieces. So since he can't play uh, b3 right away, he played the queen to c2, which, OK, protects the knight. And now you can play b3. <clears throat> now this game wasn't the most accurate played by, by both sides, um, even though the player with the black pieces was like 25-70. Um, so he, but he still, he didn't really come up with this plan in the game. So this immediately is just a great move. And then you, you get one of your knights, either knight, um, to this square. And you get a knight on d3. So this should be considered immediately. But instead, queen to c7 was played. And now white should play b3. He should you know, be stopping that knight from going to c4. But he didn't do that either. Uh, he played a strange move, bishop to e3. It's, it's very unusual to see the bishop on that square. Normally, this bishop will go to any other square. Often, uh, he's going to go to b2 after you know, you've played the move b3, because then you're on the same diagonal as black's dark squared bishop, and you're trying to neutralize him. Whenever the queen goes to a5, you'll see that often the bishop is going to go to d2, so that you know, there's some threats. You have a bishop on the same diagonal as their queen. Occasionally, you'll see the bishop go to f4. Um, the point here is maybe you want to play the move e5, and then the bishop would be useful there. You can also imagine that a bishop might go to g5, where you have a little bit of pressure um, on a pawn. And if black doesn't have his dark squared bishop, you can even imagine that the, the bishop would go to h6. But e3 is just not the square you ever want to go to with this bishop in this opening. So I can't think of another game where, where this happened. It's just it's unusual. And it shows that white doesn't really understand the opening. Um, OK, and now again, he has allowed this move, which, which wasn't played. But now it's even stronger, because uh, OK, you got, you got some good squares that you're, you're looking at. And OK, you even have pressure here. You're going to get another rook in here. But OK, you're either going to take the bishop, or you're going to maneuver a knight to d3. So this would have been excellent for black. Instead, rook f to b8 was played, which is a good idea in general. These, these rooks are mighty nice on the a and b file, because there's a, there's a lot of pressure going on here. <clears throat> which is nice, but it wasn't as good as knight to c4 immediately. <clears throat> OK, and now a big mistake. So he's relinquished his control over the e5 square. And now we're going to see it. d3 is really weak, and black is about to get all of his pieces in there. And oh, white's, in, white's in a lot of trouble here. Black is significantly better. <clears throat> um, here he comes. Again, you, you can never highlight d3 enough. That's where the knight is going. And then white did something unusual. He still should do something like try to make b3 work. Um, but he, he played f4, which he's just inviting the knight in. So he's begging the knight to go to the square it wanted to go to anyway. So not the best. OK, we're attacking this rook. We have a lot of pressure on this b pawn. You know, there's like rooks and bishops. There's lots of pressure going on um, <clears throat> all over the, the queen side. So he puts his rook on b1, um, kind of protecting his pawn. And now we'll see black do a lot of good maneuvering. He now wants to not have the knight there. He wants to have a bishop on d3, because there's a queen and a rook lined up on the same diagonal here. So a very nice move, knight to b4, attacking the queen. So always play queen to d1. And now the bishop gets to come in. And we're in a significant amount of trouble as, as white here. He can consider even giving up the exchange, because he's isn't that much trouble. Uh, he can just let black take, and then OK, admit that he's, he's a lot worse. Um, he didn't in this game. He saved the rook, which is actually a big blunder. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the audience the first question, and it's a really tough one. <laughs> black has an unexpectedly good move in this position. So I'll give you a chance to, to try to find it. There's a, there's a very nice combination that you might not even think to look for. So 
And Black was a, a very strong grandmaster, and he didn't find it. Does it have to be <clears throat> with a rook? Uh, which one? Uh, <clears throat> A8. This rook on A8? Mm -hmm. OK, I mean, this rook is, is nice. I mean, yeah, it is nice. Uh, maybe we do need to identify these sorts of things about the position. The rook is there, so in some lines he might take on a2. Right? That's, that's definitely a thing that might happen. Um, in some lines, the knight might take on a2. But, uh, <clears throat> but we'll give you uh, just a couple more seconds here to see if you can find it. It's a very difficult move to find because it's kind of a thing that can get black into a lot of trouble. And we'll see this getting black into a lot of trouble in our next game. The best move here is actually to take this knight and white is in a lot of trouble. As black, you don't want to give up your best piece, your awesome bishop on g7, just for a knight, unless you have some really good reason. So black better have a really good reason. Um, first of all, if you take with the pawn, um, OK, we take on a2, and where does, where does this guy go? You know, you're about to win an exchange, and your pieces are still running wild all over the, the queen side here. <clears throat> so slightly better is to take with a rook. And now what would black play here? <laughs> All right, we got some, some shoulder shrugs. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll give you a little bit of time. Perhaps somebody can come to our rescue. But who? <clears throat> <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, the guy that could answer the question, he left. So I'll give her the answer. All right, the best move here is knight to a4. Um, you know, you're just you're kicking these guys around a lot. Now, you're also attacking this pawn. So it's, it's a fork. If you try to stay where you can protect it, um, so you can protect it here or you can protect it here, which obviously uh, will run into some issues. I better hit new variation, or who knows what the computer's going to do. If you play rook b3, uh, your rook is going to get trapped. I'm not saying that's not what white's best move is here. Maybe it is. But you're going to have to give up the exchange this way. Your rook is trapped. OK. <clears throat> if you go back, let's say we want to protect our rook, well, now you're just, you're just in a lot of trouble. Um, these, these pieces are, are starting to crush you. You can move your queen, and I'm just taking all of your stuff. And my pieces are still awesome on the queen side, and I have a lot of threats. And you know I'm attacking all of your pieces, and my knights keep attacking all of your rooks. So this would be just horrendous for white. But uh, OK, this opportunity in this position was, was missed because it's not often you would think about taking this knight with your bishop. So we'll see what black actually played. He played knight c4, which black is still a little bit better now. But it seems odd that in this position, uh, you would trade this knight for this, or for this knight <clears throat> because, all right, this, your knight on b6 is looking pretty good. It has potential to come into a4 or c4 at the right moment. And the, the knight on d2 is a little bit clumsy. It's, it's not obvious what it's doing in there. So <clears throat> uh, knight c4, not the most accurate, though black is still feeling pretty comfortable here. So after a, a trade. Now, how should white continue? <clears throat> Probably with the move b3, um, kicking the bishop back. So he finally got the move b3 in. Um, and at some point, he'll, he'll consider playing the move a4. So I mean, black is still doing pretty well, but he's, he didn't win the game instantly, so he missed a pretty good chance. First, he kicks the knight away, which again is strange. He's again inviting the knight into the square it wants to go to. So a3, again, was not the most precise move. Um, so I've highlighted d3 again, because that's going to keep giving white headaches. Um, and this was all a result of him playing e4. If you didn't play the move e4, and you still have your, your pawn here, this sort of thing will never happen to you, because your, your pawn is protecting the d3 square, which is like the most important square <laughs> you know, to know about when you play this opening. All right, the, the rook is attacked. Um, it's hard to see what, what to do. Obviously, if you, you move away, um, you're dropping one of your pieces, because the, the bishop is still on g7. And if you play what was played in the game, rook to c2, you're dropping one of your pawns. So black gets his pawn back, but he has tons of pressure. This guy is still really weak. 
Um, it's not obvious what White's pieces are doing. And he doesn't have any serious attack. You know, he's trying to do this sort of thing with his pawns. I mean, it, it seems kind of impressive that he, he got all of his pawns here. But you don't want to try to go for an attack immediately with White. You want to stop Black from doing all this stuff to you. And, you know, and then only later maybe you'll play f4 and e4 and try to get e5 in and start attacking on the king side. <clears throat> okay, so another unfortunate move, but it's tough because your, your knight is attacked twice. <clears throat> um, this move, though, however, loses instantly. And so this one, people in here might be able to solve. What is uh, Black's best move in this position? So, uh, so we just moved our bishop off of this diagonal. I mean, dude, I'm here to learn from you. Right. <laughs> That's fine. There's a lot of incredibly intelligent people here, so I'm <laughs> we're, all, we're banking on, on one person to come up with the answer here. <laughs> okay, so you moved your bishop off the same diagonal as white's king. Um, the crusher is bishop to d4, which was played. Um, and, black, and white decided to lose the quick way. He went here, and now again a tactic. A tactic so simple, even Ben Simon can find it. All right, fine. Knight f2. <laughs> Knight f2, and uh, white resigned here. So, right, so we're forking two pieces. Um, so we're going to win the queen, and, and the game is over for white. You might be wondering what happens if king f1. OK, if king f1, all right, now we got some serious people in here. Now we're getting serious. <clears throat> if king f1, um, there's a lot of good moves. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of excellent discoveries with the bishop here. The most crushing is taking on f4. So what happens in this position? If we keep trying to run, we go to e1. So what would, what would black want to play here? And we got a lot of firepower in the audience now, so we're going to get some of these. Ben Simon. Knight takes g2. Knight takes g2, checkmate. So yeah, these bishops are awesome. And the knight is, is given the check. Um, OK, so your best move would be to go here, which is also resignable, because you're losing your queen. <laughs> And if you take this knight, it just keeps getting worse. He takes your rook. So that was a, an example of what not to do with white. White gave away the d3 square, and he went for a big attack on the king side and ignored what black was doing. Um, because he sacrificed material on the, the queen side, black is going to get really active play on the queen side immediately. So you need to be really careful and try to understand what black is trying to do and stop him from doing that before you think about um, marching your pawns in the center. So now we're going to take a, a look at a, a different game where black makes uh, some big mistakes. So in the game we're about to watch, um, black is going to make one of the, the key mistakes that you can make as black, giving away your bishop on g7 um, just to win a pawn. So we're going to check that out. So here we go. Uh, we'll get back to our, our position. <clears throat> Again, if you're, if you're just joining us, we're doing the Banco Gambit, <laughs> the Fee and Shadow variation. OK, and g3 was preferred before knight f3. Excellent, OK. <clears throat> um, so we get to our position. And the most accurate move, knight b to d7, was played. <clears throat> and in this game, white's going to play a little bit better. What's the main move here that we discussed? We looked at castling, so we know that that's the wrong answer. <clears throat> What's the, the best move for white here? Have you got it? Uh, rook B1. Excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> so rook b1, now that you're off this diagonal, white's going to be able to play moves like b3 and bishop b2. All right. So <clears throat> black goes immediately for pressure on the d5 pawn. <clears throat> All right. So there's, there's no threat at the moment. It's attacked twice. It's protected twice. So we can spend a move trying to get our bishop to b2. OK. Both players castled, and uh, 
All right, now we see a very common idea. Um, so this is an important middle game plan that we want to understand for black. The knight, uh, it's, I mean, it's strange. Why would you retreat? Well, it's going to put a lot more pressure on the center. So this is a very common maneuver. You go to e8 to c7, and you put a lot of pressure on d5. Also, when you play this move, uh, you are attacking our knight in this position. So, I mean, I've seen people do this sort of thing where they just forget that black has that dark squared bishop, and then you feel really silly when they take it. You, you always want to be aware. That's where he is. So white defends the pawn in a, the most logical way. He puts the bishop on b2. All right? Black wasn't joking. That's his plan. Uh, he's got a lot of pressure. And there's different ways that he can continue to put pressure on the d-pawn. For example, he can bring his bishop back, and he can also consider another popular uh, maneuver for black that you know, would kind of surprise you if you haven't seen it before. Rook a7 with the idea of queen to e8. And then the queen would be putting pressure on the d-pawn. So this is something we kind of want to be aware of as black. OK. <clears throat> so you'll notice, OK, we're, he is attacking this pawn twice. We're defending it twice. But now he can take if he wants to. So this is a decision that Black you know, has to think about very, very carefully. Do you want to take the bishop uh, to, <clears throat> to give away your best piece, your bishop on g7, just to win a pawn? Uh, sometimes you do. And in the other game, we saw where trading the bishop for the knight would have been an excellent move in that particular situation based on that concrete variation. But here, it's very inadvisable. And we'll see why, because Black took the knight. Now, one thing I've learned about this variation from experience is whenever they do this sort of thing, they take your knight on c3, it's pretty much never right to take with the queen. You always want to take with the bishop. And I just know that from experience. Even though black is going to have to play a move like f6, which is kind of ugly, his next move is going to come with a tempo on your queen, and you're going to have to make another queen move. So even though it, it looks appealing because you threaten checkmate and you're forcing f6, it's, uh, it's almost better, almost always better to take with the bishop. OK, <clears throat> so black takes his pawn. And then white makes a surprising move. You might expect that, OK, the bishop's going to retreat. And then you know, he's going to go from there. But he played a different move. So what amazing move did white play in this position? Queen h6. All right. All right, so now we're getting really serious in here. Queen h6, dropping the bishop. So for the other people in the class, <laughs> if we take the bishop, what was white's plan? Why did you give away a piece? Because shoulder shrug. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> yeah. Excellent. Knight g5. And I dare you to protect this pawn. So you're going to get checkmated. Um, so the, the threat on the king side is so strong that you don't have time to take the bishop. So there's a couple different ways you can try to defend. In the game, e5 was chosen. Um, not a lot better is knight to f6. Uh, if knight to f6, you can still play knight to g5. And now your threat is to first take the knight. And then you're, you're threatening the pawn on g7 again. So uh, you'd almost be compelled to play a move either e5 or put a knight on e8 where you're defending your other knight. So whenever they play e5, we're going to answer it with f4 because when we take this pawn, now this rook is on the f file. And that's going to be a really strong piece. So that's how we're going to meet it whenever they play e5. So if they play knight to e8, with the point, OK, if you give up your bishop, I'm defending and I still have control of the g7 pawn. Uh, white has a really good move here. So you can take this and win an exchange, which is good for white. But it's better to stop on c6. And it's kind of funny. Now you're threatening to take this knight, which means you're threatening to take this knight, which means you're threatening the pawn on g7. And so again, you'd have to play a move like e5. Uh, we're going to play f4. We're going to open up the f file. And uh, OK, this is very bad for black. And it's very similar to what happened in the game. So we'll, we'll check out uh, what happened. In the game, e5 was played immediately. So OK, we make our threat. We got a lot of pressure here. So he has to go back and defend. 
So, since you know what I just said, what did white play here? <laughs> All right, a lot, of, a lot of finger pointing. <laughs> Who's going to come up with it? Anybody? Yeah. Excellent. F4. The pawn's on. We're going to open the F file. Our rook's going to be great. Um, so black tries to trade for this knight. A good idea. But now we're going to open the F file. Um, so all right, we're threatening this. He's going to take our, our knight on G5 to stop us from immediately mating him. And now we have some interesting choices. But uh, OK, we're going to take the knight with the pawn, threatening checkmate again. Um, this time we have a, a lolly's mate potential on g7. So you have to guard that square as black. Um, the best way to do that, knight e6. Now uh, white just wins from here. As you can imagine, OK, a lot of these, these pieces are really good. <clears throat> um, even this guy is good. So what is the winning plan here for white? We got a really good maneuver. Have you got it? Yeah, rook f4. Rook f4, excellent, awesome. So, all right, you can't take our rook. <laughs> Checkmate. Um, and the plan is, is, you know, pretty simple. You're going to bring your rook over and you're going to threaten the g7 pawn yet again. Uh, a very common theme. So in the game, uh, black took on e2. His point is he's going to bring his bishop back and try to defend. It's not going to work, so white goes through with his plan. Black blocks, and OK, so what's the, the way to win here? <clears throat> so white still needs to attack, find some good attacking moves. But uh, if you find the right move here, then you're, you're going to win the game. Awesome. Right. And he sees the follow-up. Um, so he took here, and after bishop e4, uh, black player had enough. He gave up. Um, <clears throat> you, you might think it's mate and one, but Black can live for, for one more move. And then, OK, then he gets checkmated. So OK, so a very good game by, by white. And it shows you the dangers if you're the black player. If you give up your bishop on g7, you really got to worry about your dark squares. You gave up your dark squared bishop in this game, and then you got mated on the dark squares. So all right, so that was excellent. Now we're going to look at uh, our last game of the day. And we're going to show you a game where people both are playing well. Uh, so two really strong players. Uh, and we'll see some of the, the main motifs when, when you're playing the main, main line. <clears throat> OK, so here we go again. Uh, we'll get back to our, our position, the Banco Gambit. Um, <clears throat> all right. So in this game, castling was preferred over knight b to d7. So OK, white, white castles. Um, and now, so, right, so he does have some of these ideas. That could potentially happen with uh, you know queen c2, rook d1, um, but it's probably better first to play the move rook b1, so that you're able to play the move b3, which is kind of the the essential point of uh, of White's play here. Now this is considered to be the the main line; it's uh, the most trodden path. So we we put our queen here, which is excellent because you have a lot of pressure on the a file, but also it prevents b3 because of of the knight that would be hanging. So white should protect his knight. And we wanted to put our, our queen, or <clears throat> actually, sorry, whenever they put their queen on a5, uh, we almost always put our bishop on d2. And now sometimes there's going to be tricks. Immediately, there's no good discoveries. So if, if we waste a move with black, uh, there's, there's no good discoveries on the queen, because so, you would just lose your pawn. <clears throat> so you, you don't really have a, a threat of any discovery at the moment. But it might be useful later on. So black can afford to keep the queen there. There's, there's no threat. So in this game, <clears throat> uh, after bishop to d2, black got his other rook into the action. Again, lots of pressure on these pawns here. OK, so as white, uh, queen to, to c2. You know, we might be thinking about rook to d1 at some point. Also, if we ever move our b pawn, now our knight is protected twice by the bishop and the queen. <clears throat> All right, and black puts pressure on the d pawn. He, you know, so I, again, the, the key focus here is the d pawn. 
He's not threatening to win it immediately. So again, I just waste a move. There's no threat to win this pawn because of the discovery on the queen. Here we would take this, and we got threats on the queen. Um, so we would just win that, that knight there. So white doesn't have to do anything rash, like play e4 and give up the d3 square. <clears throat> uh, he, can, he can take his time, play the move b3. He kind of would like to play the move a4, because then he'd be threatening, if we waste a move, to play knight b5, and, and the queen is, is you know, getting trapped, kind of. So that's the kind of move he would like to make. But uh, OK, the knight's going to be able to come into c4. So we don't want to give away that square. So we play the move b3. And if we get another turn, we're going to play a4, which threatens knight to b5, trapping the queen. So black stops white from doing that. He plays queen to a3 so that you can't play um, the move a4 yourself. Now this bishop, um, even though he's, he's already moved, he really belongs on this diagonal over here. So we're going to try to get it on the same diagonal as black dark squared bishop. So uh, bishop to c1 was preferred. And after the queen moved, uh, he kicked the queen away. So, all right, which is a good move. The queen kind of has to go to only, the only square that she can go to here, g4. And that's not really where you expect to see the queen in this line, because black isn't attacking on the king side. The queen is now going to have to like, reorganize herself by going backwards and getting back on the queen side where she belongs. OK, so uh, the pawn was attacked twice, so white defended it again. And now the queen retreats. So we see the, the queen going backwards here. And uh, h3, a useful move. We're taking away the, the g4 square, just in case black was thinking of uh, doing this maneuver, as he likes to do. And you know, we're, taking, we're trying to make sure a knight never lands on e5. <clears throat> OK, so black has to come up with some plan. He's kind of stuck here. White's position is very solid. Um, he's thinking, maybe, OK, I'll go here, put a little bit of pressure on the, the b pawn. But white is clearly better. And what happens a lot in uh, these lines <coughs> is you, uh, <coughs> you, uh, you get a position where you can kind of do nothing for a long time. And if you just keep doing nothing, you don't really do any active plans. You don't try to go crazy and nuts and try to push in the center. You're just going to be better forever and ever and ever. And then sometimes black cracks. So that's what happens in this game. So that's kind of the biggest secret in chess is don't do anything. And we'll see white do a really good job of just kind of maneuvering slowly, slowly, improving his position. And black kind of runs out of a plan here. He doesn't come up with anything useful for the, the rest of this game here. So e4, can black make use of the d3 square? Probably not. We have uh, the c4 square under control, so this maneuver isn't going to happen. We, the other knight can potentially go to e5. But if you can only get one knight there, white will always have this guy waiting to be able to trade for him. So this is a, an example of when you can move your, your e-pawn, um, just because you have a good enough control over d3. All right, black should try anyway. So now, in the other game, we saw somebody put their knight on d2, and then they got into a lot of trouble on the d3 square. So this knight has to stay put. Uh, he, better, he better stay there. <clears throat> so bishop f4. Is white thinking about playing e5? Um, that's one of the things he can consider. And again, pretty much anywhere other than <laughs> here is going to be a good square. You can easily consider a move like a4 or bishop b2. Those moves are all good as well. Um, bishop f4 is, is fine. Black doesn't really know what to do. He goes here. He's got some pressure. But uh, white has everything under control. And now a really nice move that, uh, <clears throat> that I like is coming up. First, all right, he's threatening. He's, gonna, he's thinking about it. He's making black have to think what happens if he plays e5. OK, so he kind of prevents it. He puts the queen here. The queen is, is guarding the square. And he has uh, black thinking about what he's going to do. And now white can either try to play in the center, or he can try to make use of his two pawns over here. And this is what will often happen. And I really like uh, the way white for the rest of the game plays, he advances all of his pawns slowly. He makes sure he takes control over the squares the pawns need to go to. And he fights against the blockades that black might set up. So we'll, we'll see that here. He starts with a move a4. At some point, he's thinking about a5. At some point, he's thinking about b4. 
<clears throat> but uh, after this move, I, I mean, it, which doesn't really do anything, Black doesn't have a good plan here. That's, that's his problem. Uh, white plays a really excellent move um, that I've seen in some high-level games. So this is a good move to know if you're white. Black sometimes is thinking about playing the move c4 himself. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if you play the move knight to a2, whenever if c4 is ever played, you play b4. Now this pawn is protected enough so you can just keep expanding. And this would be really terrible for black. Now these pawns are coming fast. So knight a2, it might be strange, but this is one of those ideas you, you can keep in the your back of your mind when you're playing this opening. It's something that actually happens quite frequently. Um, <clears throat> OK, black is just shuffling back and forth. He's not really doing anything. So <clears throat> white could think about going crazy in the center, but also he can take his time and continue to do nothing because black isn't doing anything himself. So he can slowly improve, slowly make uh, it possible to play moves on the queen side here. So rook to c1, um, now there's a lot of pressure here. So if ever you play the move b4, you wouldn't be able to take with the c pawn because now you have two heavy pieces on the c file. So OK, so he's thinking about playing the move b4. So black gets out of the way. He moves his queen back. Um, and it's all revolving around when is white going to play before. He can do it whenever he's ready, and black is just waiting. So he takes his time, bishop d2. Now he's, he's really controlling all the squares his pawns might need to go to next. The only reason that I think black played this move here is provocation. He didn't have to, to play this move. He's obviously encouraging white to play a5. But it's, it's not obvious that that's to black's advantage. He's, he's provoking white to play a move that he wants to play anyway. Um, the knight has to go back to the only square he can go to. And white is ready to play b4. So he's done it. He, now he's, he's getting serious about this pawn over here. And it's funny, because normally it's black that gets all of his play over on the queen side. But he fooled around a little bit too much. He did an exotic queen maneuver early on. He didn't really get any of his, his typical play going. And so now here comes white. He's, he's steamrolling ahead. <clears throat> um, neither player really wants to take the pawn in this situation, because uh, taking will improve one of white's pieces. Also, if it's uh, your turn <clears throat> and you, you take here, well, then you're helping black's knight improve. So neither player is thinking about taking the pawns here. Um, what white needs to do is somehow find a way to take control over the b5. Where that's where he wants to play next. <clears throat> so knight a7. OK. And he takes. So that does give uh, the black a good square for his knight. And now, how to make progress? How do we get this guy? Look, there's a lot of pieces in the way. So what's, what's going to happen here? <clears throat> we'll see. So he's fighting against the blockade. The next square he needs his pawn to go to is a6. So we attack the, the bishop. Um, and it's hard to think, what should you do with your bishop? He comes up with kind of an interesting plan, I guess. He puts his bishop on e2, and then he's going to take this knight. And white really wants that to happen. Then he can get control of the light squares. So he just put his bishop back, and he said, go on, take my knight. So when black did take, now this bishop is going to come back, and he's going to have control over these, these light squares that the pawn needs. So now he's fighting for a6. He's got to get his pawn to a6. <clears throat> um, all right. So he's taking his time. He's not letting you know, black get anything going. He's about ready to play a6. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> um, and this is kind of nice as well. The knight is the guard of a6. So he's fighting against uh, the, the piece that's attacking a6. So he trades the knight. That way he can you know, get the square for his knight. Um, and now here, white could play a little bit better. Of course, you should always play queen d1, which is the best move here. But instead, he took. All right. So black took. And now, right, you can't take the rook, of course, because let's never forget about this guy. But uh, queen c4, again, queen d1 was, was an excellent move. And OK. What's going on here? So black does some threats, but all right. But now this guy is, is going to move, and then our, our pawn is going to try to go like this. 
All right. And then Black gets a little bit cute. He's you know, thinking here that uh, the tactics are going to work for him, but they actually don't. So here, what I guess I'll ask the class, what should white play in this position? Because black is getting a little bit fancy. You know, he's dreaming about taking here with check. And it's complicated. Does this move work? That's sort of the main question here. Can you give up the rook for two pieces? Um, of course, when your queen ends up on d4, there's going to be some threats. So it's actually a little bit more complicated than it might seem at first. So does rook takes d4 work? No. All right, we got to vote for no. He did it. He took on d4. Um, so after he takes, now it appears that our bishop is hanging, which is true. But also take note of their knight over there, which is attacked. It's tricky. When they take our bishop, though, if we just take the knight, he's taking with check. And OK, we've, we've lost an exchange here somehow. So what, is, uh, what did white actually play here? We need a better move than uh, just taking the knight immediately. Excellent. Bishop to c3, threatening uh, some checkmates on either one of these squares. So that's the most important thing black has to deal with. He has to stop getting checkmated. So f6, kind of an ugly move to have to play. But uh, OK, now that the bishop is safe, we can safely take the knight. And now we're getting really close to getting this guy all the way home. <clears throat> um, all right, he attacks our bishop. And so we move it. And now it's, it's going to become a question, where should white get his knight? This move isn't necessarily a, a good one for black, because sometimes you know, the queen is coming in. Sometimes the knight is going to find its way to this nice square or this nice square. Um, you can imagine the knight going here, where it's, it can go to either one of these squares. And they both look like a pretty nice place for a knight. Also nice is the e6 square getting really close to the black king. And there's nobody on the eighth rank. So the queen is getting ready to infiltrate. So <clears throat> all right, what, what to do? Black got a little bit desperate. And you, uh, he's going to take the knight in a second. White is getting ready to you know, make some, some big threats here. The queen is coming in. And you're, you're going to start to get into trouble. The knight has a good square. So he felt compelled to take the knight. Now we're up a piece. And we have this pawn. So the game is practically over here. Um, <clears throat> by taking the bishop, it's of course now white is actually going to be able to promote the queen. So after taking, I kind of like what white did. He just ignored that the pawn on d5 is hanging. What's, all you need to do is go make a queen. Um, <clears throat> and after, let's see. So you don't have to take the pawn. Um, if you play queen e1, though, it's only one check. We have this pawn protected, and you're not stopping us from making a queen. But OK, he gave up his d5 pawn. And now he played a nice move. Queen to b7. So now you can't trade queens, because then my pawn's going to promote. Um, and after the checks, now you got nothing. You've run out. It's nice that the queen is on the same diagonal as the king. And OK, black resigned, because you, black, white's just going to make another queen. And so the game is over. <clears throat> So hopefully, that was a good introduction for those of you that uh, are thinking about playing the Banco Gambit or want to play it a bit more. Um, keep sending in your submissions, because next week, maybe I'll pick uh, the opening that you choose. So please remember to, to like, to comment, send your suggestions, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>